Hello and welcome back to Feature Requests the Game, the show. The show where the audience suggests features and mechanics for a game and then I obediently bring them to fruition for the SEO gods. This video goes out to all the viewers who have a mad god complex and who want to create life with their own hands. That's right, I'm looking at you. I'm gonna break this one down into multiple parts, so the first video is gonna be about the birthing process and baby's first steps. Also, this channel hit 100 subs at the beginning of this month, and I really just wanted to say thank you to all of the viewers and everybody who's been supportive of this channel. We're actually just about to hit 200 subs. I really wanted to make a whole video for this, but uh, then we started coming up on 200 before I even had time to do so, which is fucking awesome. Anyhow, I hope you're nice and fertile because I'm about to show you how babies are made. So the first thing we're going to want to do is bring up our ecosystem browser. And what we're going to search for here is a pathfinding package. So it's pathfinding. That's what it's called right here. You'll see it's called a package. Um, I already installed it in here, so you could just press a get button. It's going to look a little different for you if you don't have it installed yet. I already have it installed over here. And you'll see that the actions browser for Playmaker gets updated with NavMesh and NavMesh Agent. This is a series of actions related to the NavMesh Agent component and generally Unity's built-in pathfinding stuff. Then in my assets folder, I created a new folder here called NPC. This is where I'm storing all the stuff for our NPCs. We had these FBXs from the last episodes. These were for the player animations. So I took one of these run FBXs and I dragged it into the scene. Now look at this little guy. I renamed it something like my little NPC boy or whatever you want to call it. And then in the NPC folder, I just dragged and dropped it back into it. Now it's going to say, would you like to create a new original prefab or a variant of this prefab? You're going to click original prefab. So what that did was create a prefab of this object. And you'll see that now in the scene, it's a blue cube with blue text instead of all these uh, blank gray cubes with black text. The difference here is that all these objects are just in-scene objects that are one-offs, just completely their own thing that you can only edit by actually going to each and every one of them and editing their parameters individually. With a prefab, the ones that are blue like this, these are references. They're referencing the prefab that's in your assets. So when you change the one in your assets here, it's going to change any of them that are in your scene. Now we have this in the actual hierarchy up here. Um, so if we change something from the one in here, you'll see the changes represented in here. So to edit the prefab, you could just select the one that is here in your assets. Now I'm just going to get rid of this little my little NPC boy because that's just an example. Uh, and this is the one that I made. So you could double click it and it'll open it up and you'll see that it even gets represented in this kind of like brand new scene that's like, it's not really a scene, it's just kind of this void that exists only for this prefab. So you know, even over here in the hierarchy, it's no longer your scene anymore. Now to go back to your scene, you can click this little arrow right here, click another little arrow. So now we're back in the game. Um, and if I wanted to get back to it, of course, just double click on it again. And so the reason Unity does this is because you need to sort of separate your thinking between your prefabs because they stand on their own. They are separate from your scene when you're editing them like this. Even when you come over here, if I wanted to drag in this NPC and like edit it, and let's say I want to get rid of this animator component, I'm going to remove that component. You'll see that if I double click on this one, it still has the animator component. So in the NPC prefab, it has an animator component. That is animator, not animation. Now this animator component needs an animator controller to do something with. So we're gonna go over here and right click, create an animator controller. We're gonna name it whatever the fuck you want, but preferably something useful. Okay, or you know, you can just name it uh, NPC Animator Controller. Now what you could do is you could drag and drop this into the controller slot like that. So I just went to the player animations folder and if you click on these holding control, you can select multiple of them and then you can hit control D and that'll duplicate them. And then you could just drag and drop those into your NPC folder. So now I have an idle and run animation in here. And of course, make sure that loop time is checked. 
on both of these. And in the NPC animator controller, if you double click on it, you can get this animator controller window. And what you could do is you could literally just drag in these animation clips. So if I delete these to show you what it looks like in the beginning, if I just drag in run, it'll make that one the orange one because that's the first thing I dragged in and then idle and just put it like that. So back on this NPC object, I added a nav mesh agent component. So I changed this angular speed to 500 just so the enemies, when they're turning around, they could turn around faster. Otherwise they're kind of, they get a little floaty. And then of course I put a playmaker FSM on here and I just named it behavior. So really quick, just looking at these components for this NPC, it has an animator component, which does exactly what it sounds like it does. It controls all the animation aspects of this NPC. Then we have this playmaker FSM, which, you know, we're going to be putting all the playmaker programming in. And then this nav mesh agent component, which is Unity's built in Pathfinder system. We're going to be using Playmaker to talk to this. Now, nav mesh agents need a nav mesh to be an agent on. So what we're going to do is we're going to go back to the scene. And if I just click on scene up here, um, for mine, I had this building with these sidewalks and stuff, depending on whatever you're doing, it's going to be different. But so for me, what I was able to do was I was able to just click on this. And thankfully, this sidewalk is just one big piece. Now with that selected, I was able to go over here to navigation and then under object I clicked navigation static so that's checked and then the navigation area I set to walkable now with that selected you can go over here to bake and then you hit bake and unity will create this mesh all that blue stuff which all of our nav mesh agents can traverse across. So you'll see some of these settings over here, agent radius, agent height, step height, max slope, and all this stuff. Now, what it does is you can see how this nav mesh has an edge to it. So this is Unity doing its best job to figure out where the edges of this walkable area are. If, for example, I wanted to make sure that my NPCs weren't gonna run into like a pole or something, I can select the pole and then go over to object, navigation static, and then change this to not walkable. Now watch what happens when I hit bake. You see it created a little space around that. Now I don't really give a shit about that, I'm just gonna leave it anyway. Now you know how to make your agents avoid certain things. So that's what all of these variables are for. This agent radius is saying this is the radius of the actual NPC and that kind of affects the boundaries by which Unity creates these little barriers around non-walkable objects. So if I change this radius to something like 3 and then press bake, all that shit goes away. So let's see, let's do one so you can see an even clearer example, hopefully. You see how it's like this? This kind of like makes this little like invisible barrier. So like 0.5. Right, you see, so like the smaller the agent radius, the kind of the radius around whatever the NPC is, uh, the more room you're gonna get around these things. So, yeah, so I'm gonna keep this at point two for me. Um, and then the agent height, this affects if we had steps and stuff in our scene, sort of uneven terrain, you could change this agent height and step height to change how big a step has to be or how small a step has to be for an NPC to step over or onto it. Really quick note, you won't see the nav mesh when you're not in this tab. So if you kind of looks like it disappeared, you can always just click on this and you'll see what it looks like. Uh, but it's gonna go away once you're back in Inspector. So with our little NPC selected, I'm gonna show you what's inside of this behavior FSM. So I'm gonna click edit and this is what we got right here. So we have three states. We have the find a random location state, the en route state, and the arrive state. So find a random location starts with an animator play and that plays the run animation. This has to be typed in exactly how it is in your animator controller. So it's run with a lowercase r and it's all one word, no space before, no space after, just r-u-n and that's it. So in here, that's what I typed, same exact thing. Uh, and it's set to owner, so that's gonna tell this object. So this animator play is only gonna play that animation for its owner. So this FSM is on this NPC object right here. 
and that's the same place that the animator component is on. Uh, if this animator component was on something else in here, it would this animator play would not affect it. You would have to change which game object. You'd have to specify game object and change it to whatever that one is. Then we have a set agent is stopped, and it says is stopped, and it's unchecked, right? So that's another way of saying is not stopped. So what that says is that the agent can continue going. The reason this is here is because at the end of this, there is an agent stopped, which does stop it. And when we get sent back to this, we want it to resume. So this is sort of resetting things. Then there's a get position, which gets the position of the NPC at that moment, and it stores it into this vector three called current position, and it's in the world space. Then we have two random floats. One is for the x-axis, and one is for the z-axis. That's basically your floor plane, right? X and Z are kind of the flat parts of the world. So I set these minimum and maximum to negative 20 and 20, negative 20 and 20. So the way you can look at that is like on a graph, it's going back negative 20 and forward negative 20. So it's kind of like it's even on both sides. And then you can look at it on the same way for the other axis. So at a zero point, you can imagine that it could put itself anywhere on a grid within 20 moves away, within 20 units away. And I store these random floats into these variables. One is a random X and one is random Z. Then I have a vector three add X, Y, Z which takes that current position vector that we just made, and it adds the random x and random z to that vector 3's x and z. And I left the y axis alone here. So this is where the random position really gets created. This get position, these two random floats, and then the thing that ties them all together. So these two random numbers get added to that NPC's current position, and then that creates the new random location. Then I have a nav mesh sample position. And what nav mesh sample position does is it takes a vector three and then it checks if that point is on a nav mesh. And if it's not, you can tell it to give you a point on the nav mesh that's closest to wherever that is. And the way you do that is you say, okay, here's the vector three I want you to check, which is that current position one, right? The one from up here. And if your max distance doesn't match up with the range on the vector that you created up there, it'll give you some errors. So if you're running into some weird things, you might want to either try uh, lowering or raising this max distance. And then right here, the hit information of the sample, this position part, this is a position that it will create. It's a vector three that it will create which will say, okay, here's the closest point on a nav mesh to that random thing that you just gave me. So you can click right here and then new variable, and I'm naming this new variable random vector three on mesh. So this one is for sure on a mesh now. It's the closest thing we have to the random thing we just generated above it. And then at the very bottom, we have a set agent destination and we set it to that on mesh vector three that we just created. So that's telling the agent that's where you wanna go. So this path pending done event is actually pretty important and it's because you can get some weird errors if you don't let Unity finish calculating the path before it goes on to the next thing, which is fucking confusing. So this basically says I'm calculating the path for this NPC to this destination. Now when it's calculating that path, it might not finish calculating if you just throw in a next frame event or send event and go on to the next thing and have it do something. So what you can do is you can have it wait that fraction of a second, even if it's like this tiny imperceptible little wait time that you have. You can set it so you won't go on to the next state until it's done computing that. So that's what we have here. Path pending done event is set to fin. So when it's done calculating this path, we get sent off to the next one. So this next state is in route. So we have a random wait and a get agent remaining distance. Now I'm gonna tell you about this last one first just cause this kind of might make more sense. Um, so in this get agent remaining distance, the only thing I have here is the arrived event. I'm not really storing a result and I'm checking every frame. So what this is for is it says, okay, when the agent reaches its destination, it will go on to the next state. So now with that being said, the reason I have a random wait up here is just in case the agent has any problems getting to its destination. We know that on a timeline anywhere between five to 10 seconds, it'll just say it's arrived there because it doesn't really matter where we put these. We just want it to have like a random wandering path. So whether it arrives at the position or it's close, but at least anywhere between five to 10 seconds has passed, uh, we go here to the last state, this arrived state. 
Now at this arrive state, we start with an animator play, which plays the idle animation. So it's arrived there, and now the NPC is going to play the little idle animation. Uh, then set agent is stopped, which stops the agent there in its tracks. And this time we see it's set to is stopped, that box is checked. Um, and then another random wait, and this is anywhere between three to six seconds. And this is set to real time before going off to the next state, which sends us back to the beginning. That's what it takes to make an NPC randomly wander around an area. Now we don't have any NPCs in our scene, so let's put some of these guys in here. So you're gonna right click and create an empty game object. You're gonna call it spawner. And I put mine right here. This is kind of around the area that I want them to start spawning. So we gotta throw a Playmaker FSM on it. I'm just calling it spawner. We hop into this. We'll see that we have three states. There's a create NPC state, a count NPC state, and a stop. So create NPC state, what does it have? Start with a get owner. So that just says, hey, this game object, we're storing it as a variable so we can reference it when we want to do stuff with it in here. Then we have a create object and the game object we want to create. You could literally just drag and drop NPC into here. And at the spawn point, we're setting it to this spawner. And then we're gonna store the object in the last spawned NPC. So we're saying, okay, so okay, just remember what the last NPC you created was. And there's a get child action which I'm using to get the mesh of the NPC that we just spawned. So the way that works is it checks what our last spawned NPC was, right? And it checks the child name, Mesh. Uh, and that's just because if we go into our NPC here, we'll see that the Mesh is a game object called Mesh. Uh, and then it stores that result as last NPC Mesh. So now it knows what the Mesh of our most recent NPC is. Now that it knows that, it's gonna set a random material on it. So the game object for this is last NPC Mesh. And then I set it to three materials. So you just put in a number here and then you hit tab and it'll give you three empty slots. And I just dragged in three materials in here that are literally just a blue, red, and white material. And so that does exactly what it sounds like it's gonna do. It's going to randomly color all of the NPCs when they get born into the world. Then there is an int add and the variable that we're gonna be changing is the number of NPCs and we're gonna add one. So it gets the owner this game object right here, it creates a game object, which is the NPC prefab that we have, and its spawn point is this owner right here, and then it remembers that who it just spawned, and then it gets the child mesh of that thing it just spawned, and then it sets a random material to the mesh of that thing it just spawned, which is any red, white, or blue thing. And then it adds one to this variable, so it just starts counting up. This int add thing just starts counting up every time we come back to this state, it just adds one, adds one, adds one. So for each NPC that gets spawned into the world, it adds one. We have this int add here, so we could later set a limit on how many NPCs should get spawned. And then at the very end of this, there's a next frame event, which sends us to the count NPCs state. And here, there's just an int compare, and this is where you could set your cap. So it's checking the number of NPCs, and it's comparing it to and then whatever you want to compare. You could set this to a variable, you could change this in other ways. Uh, I just typed in 25 here. So what this is saying is it says, if the number of NPCs, this integer one, is equal to 25, then it's gonna do this thing, fin. It's gonna take us up here to stop, which is just another way of saying, hey, when there's 25 NPCs, stop spawning them. But if it's less than, it's gonna say try again, which is this try again transition that sends us back here. And it runs through all these actions again, and it comes back here and does that over and over again until we have 25 NPCs where it stops. And at the stop state, we have nothing because we don't need to do anything once we're here. So as a little bonus, if you go over here to game manager and just put in your first thing that happens here, the first action, a set mouse cursor, and then select both these boxes for hide cursor and lock cursor. And what that does is it makes sure that when you're running the game, you can't see your mouse cursor, and then it locks it to the center of the screen, right? And that's what we have. Look at all these beautiful babies. Look at all these beautiful, freaky little babies. Look at them. Look at my children. Yes, I created you. I am your creator. I'm your creator. Oh, you're so sneaky. Look at you. You're so sneaky. Oh, where are you sneaking off to? 